The UK economy slipped into a recession last year after a difficult period in which interest rates were ramped up to a 15-year high and taxes went up too. The country has seen years of political instability, the negative impact of leaving the EU. In short, throw a rock and you can find someone with something pretty dismal to say about the prospects for Britain. But is that really the whole story? Some economists and business leaders increasingly see a more positive case for the UK economy, more resilient and dynamic at heart than it might at first seem. We have low unemployment, a stabilising housing market and some more positive business activity surveys recently. Plus, of course, the AI revolution coming to workplaces. So in a crucial general election year, we think... Could the next UK government find itself with a more favourable economic outlook? Well, joining me now to discuss this is Romy Savova, who is founder and CEO of Pension B, Matt Clifford, who is co-founder of Entrepreneur First, and ran the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's AI Summit, and Rain Newton-Smith, Chief Executive of the Confederation of British Industry. Welcome to all of you for Bloomberg Radio and TV. Thank you so much for your time. Rain, I'd love to start with you first, if I may, because you are really the voice of British business at the CBI. Do you think there is a bullish case to be made for the British economy? Absolutely. Look, I think if we think about so many of the UK's capability, and I was just this week been speaking with some of the big investors in uh, UK's offshore wind and the, the energy transition, if you think about the big transitions globally we need to make. The UK can, is really at the heart of some of those. And, and thinking about renewable energy, the world's largest offshore wind five farms, five of those are located around the UK. And speaking to some leaders about who are working on investments in technologies here in the UK around how we electrify transport, mm. uh, thinking about our trains and also around not just passenger vehicles, but the whole fleets on the roads. I think the UK is in, in leading in so many areas. And also, you know, if you think about higher education, we're so lucky to have in every region of the UK, one of the world leading universities. And that leads a whole ecosystem around research and development and our creative industries. I do think the UK have so many capabilities, but we can't rest on our laurels. And, mm. and to make the most of that, we need to make sure we have an environment which is really competitive globally in terms of our overall tax landscape. I think we've seen some important steps that the government have taken on that, but there's still more uh, to be done. And we need to make sure that we're open to people and talent from around the world and that we create the right ecosystem around innovation to attract some of the best companies here into the UK. And yet, of course, the UK slipped into recession in 2023. How can you be so positive when actually the growth story isn't there yet? Look, we know now that we we're in a tech, what, what economists will call a technical recession. But I think in a way, whether we've seen a couple of quarters of negative of near negative growth, it hasn't been what one thinks of as a, a real lasting recession where we see high unemployment and uh, negative growth for many quarters. What we've seen is a slipping into negative territory for a couple of quarters. But importantly, I think that follows after 18 months where growth in the UK has has stagnated. Mm. I think one of the positives is we have a real consensus actually across the political spectrum that we really need to focus on driving sustainable growth in the UK, that we need you know, our own economic forecast. We think we will see growth this year around 0.8% uh, as a whole for this year and, and rising to 1.5% uh, the year after. So we are expecting the UK economy to grow this year. But to really build on that, we'd like to see more ambitious growth for the UK. We know it's been a difficult time for us. We really need to make sure we've got plans in place to grow business investment, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to grow our people and talent here in the UK uh, and, and have the right innovation. So we absolutely can't rest on our laurels. Rami, let me turn to you. I mean, you are an innovative business in the UK, uh, focused on the pensions industry. And this government, uh, under Rishi Sunak and the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, have made quite significant efforts to try to reform, including the mansion house reforms. Do you think that those are going to make a significant difference in terms of boosting the economy by increasing uh, investment and you know, the options for pension savers to invest? 
Well, I do think the mansion house reforms still remain very much in a voluntary phase. Mm. Um, I think that until we see the investment opportunities within the UK economy for pension funds, that most pension funds will simply seek out the best investment opportunities on a global basis, because pension funds like us are very much here to represent the views and the interests of consumers. And so there has to be a wholesale alignment, I believe, between consumers and the pensions industry more broadly. Now, there is some more uh, slated reform within the pension sector, which could be very transformative. And it's something that the government has been calling uh, a pot for life, meaning that consumers will be able to choose exactly where their pensions are paid into by their employers. And should this go ahead in a reasonable time frame, it can really give consumers the voting choice and the voting power to support the kinds of businesses and the kinds of investments, including in the UK economy, that might benefit us all. But does that specifically help the issue with listings in the UK with actually driving more money into what is a very beleaguered stock market that's seen huge outflows last year that has underperformed versus the US versus Europe since 2008 at least? I believe it very much can stimulate business economic activity here, here in the UK. And the reason for that is that we need capital to go into businesses, but it can't be forced capital, uh, which is somehow the way that the mansion house reforms can come across. It needs to be voluntary on the basis of good performance. And so to create that circularity about investment and investment driving performance, there has to be a little bit of a stimulus. And the consumer can very much be in the driving seat to make those decisions. Mm. Matt, I think the biggest um, issue for, for the UK, or at least the, the, the biggest change that could be coming to workplaces is the artificial intelligence. Um, evolution, revolution, you've been at the heart of that. You advised uh, the Prime Minister, you helped to create the AI Safety Summit. It happened just before Christmas. And that actually, despite all the naysayers, it was really very well received, wasn't it? But do you think that you got the balance right between the risks, the word safety, and also the actual opportunities that the UK could see from AI? I think the reason to care about safety is because of the opportunities. I mean, the reality is that if you look at where the public is on this issue, safety is right at the top of their concerns when it comes to AI. And, you know, I would like to see AI broadly diffused through the economy. I think it's going to be, uh, you know... Probably most people listening are already seeing this in their everyday lives, but, you know, it's very poorly diffused today through businesses, uh, through education, through public services. Unfortunately, the UK historically has not been very good at technology diffusion, at least in the sort of software and Internet era. And it's very, very important that that happens. I think it's probably the single biggest lever we have to improve productivity across the economy and particularly in public services. But at the moment... Uh, unless you can convince the public that AI is safe and unless you can address some of the very live safety issues mm. uh, around, you know, kind of trust and believability, around um, accuracy, uh, you know, factuality, then actually uh, the usefulness of this technology, which is already very powerful but, but, but limited by those uh, challenges, uh, we're just not going to see the benefits. And so, you know, I think, I think the government was right to put safety at the heart of the AI agenda because actually the, the incentives to adopt safe AI are very strong, but without that focus on safety, uh, then we're going to miss the, the, the opportunities that AI creates. I was really interested speaking to the chairman of Marks & Spencers, who was talking about how he has analysts and how AI is being diffused really across the whole of the Marks & Spencers business. The WPP CEO, Mark Reed, was speaking to me also about you know, the rapidity with which advertising is taking on board AI. They are making some investments and they do see some benefits but they mark reed said britain has got to lean in if the services based economy in britain is actually going to see the benefits from from ai i mean does the uk need to do that be more positive about receiving this what could be a huge revolution i mean i think i think that's absolutely key that uh 
that there's a sort of unified strategy across government, big business, and, and small business to make sure that we that we get adoption. If you think about what that's going to take, there's a few things. I mean, one is we we need to make the UK the best place in the world to build AI infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really striking uh, how much the AI revolution is really a, a computational revolution. It's about being able to marshal enormous amounts of computational power um, uh, into these models, both when we train them and when we use them. Today, there are lots of companies that would like to build AI infrastructure in the UK. In fact, there was a recent horror story, economic horror story, where you know, one of the big tech giants was going to make a $2 billion investment in a data center in the UK specifically for high-performance computing. And it was vetoed by a local authority you know, planning thing because it you know, obscured a view from a railway bridge. And so I think the UK has to like, get serious about whether it wants to be an AI superpower. If it does, that's going to need you know, really uh, tough decisions about things like planning, about things like energy. This is a very energy intensive revolution. I think mm, coming yeah, back absolutely. to your point, you know, actually there's a really nice marriage that's possible between things like offshore wind and, mm. and, and, and AI. So there's, there's a whole infrastructure piece. But I think there's also a, a big education piece about how to use AI. You know, we're not at the stage, you know, this is, you know, when we talk about safety, we're not talking about killer robots. In fact, the, the, the real challenge today is, like, can humans use AI well enough to make a difference to their own productivity? That's not easy. Which is exactly where I want to bring you in at the CPI, Rain. The skills gap mm. in the UK, or, or simply the skills that the workforce has, do we have those skills, the willingness to learn, to adapt to this new technology? Are we training people quickly enough? We absolutely need to do more. I think we've got the willingness and the capability. And I think, as Mark was saying, it's some, uh, you know, there is the broader infrastructure we need to see in place. So one of the things we've been talking with the Chancellor and with the Shadow Chancellor is we need to now be focused on implementing planning reform to allow some of these infrastructure and data centers to be here in the UK. Uh, we also need the grid connections, right, to, to power that. And we need to make sure that that is powered as well by renewable energy. And when it comes to the skills uh, to deliver not just that, but how we adopt AI, and I think one of the ways is making it understand, understandable in the sense that this is just really incre increasing our, compu you know, our computing power. Mm -hmm. It is an evolution from some of the technologies that have existed before. But what we need to make sure is that we have capabilities, so we have, we're open to talent from around the world where some of the best uh, you know, we're attracting some of the best entrepreneurs here mm. to the UK and allowing them to set up businesses and bring some of that know-how. Uh, but thus, we're also working with our universities, our further education colleges and our businesses because we're all living and working longer. We all need, you know, at my age, I need to be uh, understanding how I am using AI in leading within my own organisation, which is ultimately a but service But that's all very long-term. Does this deliver growth for the UK now, this year, in 24, 2025? I, look, I think absolutely. If you talk to business leaders now, as, as you've done as part of this programme, they're saying they are adopting these technologies within those, these businesses now. This is not something that's you know, it, the revolution will continue for many years, but it's absolutely a readily available technology that businesses are implementing. But we need to help some of our smaller businesses understand how they can access this technology. And I do think on the regulation space, it's actually an area, and, and also the mansion house reforms mm. is another area where I think the UK is leading the world in developing proportionate regulation that really facilitates that adoption in a way that is safe and gives people confidence. Well, speaking of those reforms, another piece of the puzzle is that the Chancellor has been talking about creating this um, Brit ISA that would actually funnel money from pension funds into some of these growth UK businesses. Is that something that you think is going to make a big difference? Would you like to see it adopted at the budget? Well, I think the Brit ISA could definitely make a difference. It's, it's, again, one of those initiatives that puts consumers in the driving seat of choosing the kinds of investments that they want to be selecting to save for retirement. And it will enable them to put their money to good work within the UK economy, possibly with some additional tax incentives. So it's very hard to find something not to like about it, other than the fact that perhaps it makes the ISA regime a little bit more complicated than it already is. So if we can simplify ISAs a little bit more and offer some extra incentives for investing in the UK economy, it does feel like a win-win situation. Do you see any evidence that the capital markets in the UK, that the London market is improving? We've had not just a dearth of IPOs, but actual delistings in the last 12 months. 
Is there any evidence that you see that that might be changing, again, in the next year or two years? Well, we can certainly see that some investor sentiment amongst UK investors is growing more positive. And for many quarters, they have experienced negative outflows, uh, which means money is leaving them and probably going into overseas investment jurisdictions. Over the past few months, there have been, um, I suppose, more green shoots about money coming back in to those fund managers and therefore them having a more positive sentiment on investment opportunities and the economy generally. But in order for them to do well, ultimately, British business must do well. And if British business does well, then investment will flow not only from our domestic investors, but also from international investors. Rain, I was speaking to the Lloyds of London CEO, um, John Neal. He says, and he's adamant about mm. this, we need a two-term government in order to deliver the sort of stability to create that economic growth in the UK. Do you agree? Look, I think what we are trying to do is build those areas of political consensus. And I think there is a clear focus on driving sustainable growth in the UK. And we absolutely need to see some of that stability. So one example of, of that is we saw the Chancellor make uh, a bold move in, in the autumn statement around uh, allowing full expensing around, uh, on capital. So that's, that's making our business tax landscape really competitive for investment here in the UK. And we've seen the Shadow Chancellor also back that policy. So that means uh, whoever is in charge uh, after the general election, we've, businesses have the confidence that that is a policy that will remain. So I see our job and, and for many business leaders to really help to build where there are areas of political consensus to really drive some of that long-term stability. And I think we do need to celebrate some of the capability the UK has. So where are the, some of the areas we're really going to lead the world? And AI regulation and adoption is absolutely one of it. All, also is thinking about financial services and our, our broader capability. So whether that's thinking about the pensions industry or, or insurance, these are areas where the UK has led the world. We need to build on that capability. So our view is whoever is in charge, we want both uh, parties, we want all parties to be really focused on some of the UK's core capabilities and setting out a long-term strategy to deliver that. Matt, do you think that it's necessary for artificial intelligence and for the developments there that we have stability in government, a two-term government, whoever that might be? I think right now AI is not a partisan issue and that's a really positive thing uh, and I hope it stays that way. I, you know, I do think this is going to be the fundamental technology of the, of the next decade. Um, and, and I think the thing that's important to understand is um, by default the UK... Um, the UK will you know, neither benefit nor you know, suffer because of AI. It's entirely in our hands what happens. You know, AI is being developed uh, you know, as we speak by you know, very large, uh, very capable organizations. Actually, partly in the UK, we're very lucky to have one of the two top AI organizations in the world right here in London, uh, in Google DeepMind, the other being OpenAI. And you know, they're going to continue to uh, develop this tech regardless of what we do. It's going to almost certainly develop in capabilities very quickly. And really the question is, does, does the UK want to be an AI maker or an AI taker over this decade? I don't think that's necessarily about who's in government. I think that's, are we willing to make whoever's in government the long-term investments needed, both in, in sort of education and skills, in infrastructure, in adoption, uh, required to harness that power? Mm. Um, Romy, in terms of, you know, we're thinking about whether there is a more positive case in the UK. I think part of the AI story is about the strength of the consumer, whether the consumer and the worker in Britain, you know, wants to take AI forwards, wants to adopt it, wants to, to grow. What's your sentiment around consumer confidence and therefore business confidence in Britain now? Do you, do you see the green shoots that you mentioned? Absolutely. I think the UK is a consumer economy. Consumption accounts for about 60% of GDP. And so the UK consumer is the British economy. And therefore, I think it's important to have that alignment that if consumers do well, ultimately business will do well as well. And so the green shoots that we're seeing are very much on, uh, on, on the consumer confidence side. We can see that sentiment is improving about future prospects. It feels like the cost of living crisis is easing. There is an expectation that inflation will come down further. 
that interest rates will come down and ultimately that life will be more affordable and enjoyable. And it's that consumer promise that ultimately must be delivered for everyone to thrive. So I think that's really the issue that we need to keep investing in, making the UK consumer better off financially and I think better equipped uh, because this is a... Um, a high skills, a high services economy, there is absolutely every reason that everyone should thrive here. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rain, um, I hear so much positive rhetoric from economists, from business people. The data's not quite there yet. Is it more than rhetoric? Is this year going to be a better year, do you think, for the UK? Look, I do think this year will be a better year, and it, it's building on what Romy was saying. In inflation is coming down, it will come down further. And what we're also seeing, what has made it so difficult for so many households, has been the fact that pay growth hasn't kept pace with that high inflation. But as inflation comes down, and we're now seeing uh, that we should see some positive movement in, in pay in real terms, so essentially people's pay will uh, reach further this year, and that will help to drive uh, households and, and give them uh, more resources. So I think that is one of the reasons why people are seeing green shoots uh, in the economy. But of course, for that, for pay growth to be matched, you know, to outpace inflation in real terms over time, what do we need? We need productivity growth. And that is about how we help our businesses invest in people, in skills, in innovation and in uh, technologies like AI and, and, you, and show how that helps all of us be more productive at work rather than seeing it as a technology that is to be feared. We are very lucky in the UK to have low employ, unemployment mm. and that has really been a bedrock for the UK economy. So if we can start to see pay growth picking up in real terms and maintain that low unemployment, that will mean that the prospects feel brighter for the UK economy. Okay. Um, a last thought, Romy, on the demographic challenges for the UK. I mean, you're, you know, you have more than what, 250,000 customers or thereabouts. You're plugged into the UK saver. In terms of the demographic challenges, there is, you know, concern about whether people have enough savings. What, what, what is your view on the, those challenges around demography in Britain, the aging population that Britain does have? Well, I think, again, there are positive shoots to, to look at. I think that large parts of the UK population have accumulated wealth that can serve them well into retirement, whether that's housing wealth or whether that is pension wealth. Pension wealth is actually um, an incredibly important constituent of the UK's overall wealth. So I think that there are savings that are absolutely in place. And I think, again, if you look at the, the younger aspects of the population, the younger demographics, they will be going through automatic enrollment, mm. meaning they will be automatically saving every year. And by the time they do retire, they are likely to have a good nest egg. It could be better. We could increase contribution rates further through automatic enrollment, but we are definitely on the right track for retirement income provision. For those who have not yet made the retirement provision that they know that they need, there are personal saving solutions. And our view this year in particular is with consumer um, you know, expenditure needs kind of easing, um, that there is more room for saving. And we're certainly seeing that in the contributions that people are making into their pensions this quarter. Mm. Matt, if there's one thing that you'd like to see again in terms of the policy framework that the UK has, in terms of attracting investment into Britain, and that is the thing that is going to help the economy to grow. It's attracting investment into the UK. The WPP CEO, um, Mark Reed, was telling me that he is using AI tools, but they're all tools that have been created in the United States. He doesn't really need to invest that much money because those tools are there. And, and so that question about the low investment issue that Britain does have, again, how do we, how do we improve on that? 
I mean, I think, I think the, the things that we've touched on already, I mean, I do think planning is a huge lever. I think there's lots of reasons why this is a great place to build AI infrastructure, but, you know, planning and energy are a, a big bottlenecks. Um, and then the other big one is talent. And, you know, everyone's brought this up. You know, the, if, if you want to make the positive case for the UK, I think the obvious starting point is talent. We do have the best universities in the world uh, outside the United States. We have, um, you know, one of the best, maybe the best startup ecosystem in the world outside uh, the United States. Uh, we have you know, a really extraordinary range of, of tech companies, but the lifeblood of all those things is talent. And we have to be willing and able to not just let the best and the brightest from around the world come in, but you know, actively you know, court and welcome them. And that's really the, um, you know, the, 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 that's the fuel that's going to make uh, the UK investable. Thank you so much to all of you for joining me. I think we should end on that positive note because that is really the point of what we've been talking about today, that there has been so much gloom. We are concerned about the kind of technical recession, as you say, Rain, but the opportunities for the UK and perhaps a brighter picture for whichever government actually takes over this year, perhaps next year, is there you know, a more positive case to be made for the UK? Romy Savova, thank you so much for being with me. Matt Clifford, thank you for your time. And Rain Newton-Smith, thank you.